Sports Buddies, good morning and welcome to another Ask Andy. Can you believe this is the 21st episode? I can't believe it. What's happening to the year? Where has it gone? Thank you for joining me on this Friday morning, although I am actually recording it on Thursday night. After the mighty carrots saw off Sheffield United, we blunted the blades in a massive one all battering um so i'm in quite a good mood as you can tell uh thanks for joining me guys remember if you enjoy this video please hit that like button i can't tell you what it does for the channel and if you're not already a balls buddy and a member of this wonderful community of ours please hit the subscribe button it's totally free of charge and don't forget to click the notification bell for notifications of new content on this channel. There we go. It's out the way, done and dusted for another episode. So, I've been putting this one off actually. It's quite a juicy one. Uh, but other things have been coming up and I've had it sort of held back for a couple of weeks. Maybe even a couple of months actually thinking about it. And it's from Ken Gray, our friend from Blackpool I think it is. And it's a very very simple question he just wants to know why do top players break the rules all the time seems a reasonable question to ask and i'm sure you know what sort of rules we're talking about so not having your foot on the mat running up the line stamping balls um stuff like that sending your ball before the jack stopped or your opponent's ball has stopped all those fruity types of things that ultimately don't really make a lot of difference but to explain this we need to think about history and the history of the game to be more precise there used to be um, if you go back a hundred plus years a thriving professional bowling scene and anyone who was any good at the game made a living either on the panel playing against um, the other members of the panel or money matches at various venues around the north west of england and if you look at the sporting chronicle and other newspapers from around the late uh, 1800s early 1900s you'll see that there were hundreds of these matches being played every week and they were playing for the equivalent of a working man's wage so if you were a miner earning i don't know let's say 20 pounds a year you'd be playing 101 up game of balls for about the same amount um, and at the time the professional bowlers were like the professional footballers of today they were earning that sort of money you know playing for a year's wage nearly every day um, and as such the people who went to watch those games wanted to see quick games, I mean 101 up, can you imagine, 101 up, and sometimes they'd split them on two greens, you'd play 51 up on one green, and then go to another one, I mean, fantastic, so, the spectators that would go and pay money to watch these events, and bet on them of course, because it was one of the few places you could actually bet at the time, horse tracks, horse racing, you had to go to the, the race track, professional crown green bowling, you could have a bet when there weren't such things as, as bookmakers, licensed bookmakers, it was all, you know, like the Peaky Blinders, all under the all under the table and highly illegal. So they wanted a, a game that was quick, simple to watch, um, and the rules were pretty lax, as long as certain rules were abided by, you know. Did it really matter if your foot, all your foot wasn't entirely on the mat? No, not really. Uh, did it matter if you sent your ball while the jack had a yard to run? No, not at all. And if you weren't running up your balls and stamping, they'd probably think you were throwing the game. So it was almost a prerequisite for a professional bowler at the time to run after balls, to be aggressive, to be flamboyant, um, and to look like they were trying. Because one of the worst criticisms you could ever, ever level at a professional is... They weren't trying or they were throwing a game. Compare, compare that to the amateur side of the, of the sport. And it was, I guess, pretty similar to as it is now. It was mostly played in the parks. 
gentlemen of a certain age, very few women playing, and they had more um, stringent rules, I guess. You know, it was a bit more gentlemanly, a bit more genteel. Striking wasn't a thing. Um, and uh, running after your balls, and you'll be taking your waistcoat off next. It was that sort of thing. And over the years, of course, that sort of bowling came under the auspices of British Crown Green, um, and it used to be called the British Crown Green Amateur Bowling Association. That that was left out of the their title, I think, in about 1979. So they had their rules, and you know, at one time or another, you couldn't send the jack within four yards of the edge if you was within four yards of the edge you had these flags up i never played in it so i wouldn't know uh, you weren't allowed to play near the crown of the green and anywhere within a yard of the crown they had a bottle top you know in the professional game you could go anywhere you wanted so there were these differences and over the years as professional bowling sort of changed into competition bowling I think a lot of those rules sort of not sort of oh what's the word I'm looking for unconsciously followed that that progression so you had the professional rules and of course the Waterloo and the Talbot were the two big comps and I think those competitions professionals and amateurs could enter but they were always played under Blackpool rules, which were almost identical to the professional rules. And there were competitions that amateurs could only play in, and they were played to the British Crown Green rules, and, prof and competitions only professionals could play in, and they were played to professional rules. And they never really mixed. There was this Waterloo rules for the Talbot and, and the Waterloo and that sort of thing, well, Blackpool rules rather than Waterloo rules. And that's how competition bowlers ended up playing really as the 60s and 70s um, arrived and more competitions um, were happening they adopted the professional rules more than the British Crown Green rules and some competitions had their own slight versions of them uh, you, you know you could measure with a straw and things like that and I just think that that is how competition bowling has gone. It's followed the professional route. And although we don't have two throws of the jack anymore, and although we don't really have stamping, it's sort of gone with the territory, if you will. And, and the top players, the ones that enter competitions and pay money, they don't want to be hindered by these almost archaic rules, you know. Um, and most of the time they don't really need any rules because you just get on with it and I've said this before I'll play to whatever rules anyone wants to if I'm playing Joe Bloggs in a, in a competition and he wants to run up the line and stamp his balls happy days, I'll join in, I'll do exactly the same because I, I don't mind and if I play in the third division Rams bottom league game against Doris from, I don't know, Rose and Crown I'll have to abide by the British Crown Green rules because I don't want to upset her. I don't want to fall out with anyone. And at the end of the day, we're not playing for the town hall clock. But in competitions, in big competitions, you are. And you just get on with it. You know, if somebody's not got their toe on the map, so what? I'll just stand with, without my toe on the map. If somebody wants to walk up the line, I'll walk up the line. I'm wider than they are, probably, so I don't mind. And if you look back, I suppose when when balls got popular on television, all of a sudden we wanted referees involved in finals days. And I've never seen a referee in all the years I've been in final competitions I actually do anything apart from walk around the green and get involved with measures. They've never had to tell anyone the rules and explain what should happen and and kick balls off and they're just there to almost make the organizers life a little bit easier which is fine and i've been on record and i've said this before the places where we need referees aren't in finals days they're in league games they're in second division third division games where nobody knows the rules where nobody knows who's right or wrong and all they've got is an out of date B 
Street British Crime Green book from 1987 in the cupboard. But you're not going to have a referee at a league game, are you? Instead, you have them at competition finals days. Where I think they're just there. Well, maybe not these days. You don't you don't actually see a lot of referees anymore at competitions. They've sort of gone by the wayside. But there was a time in the 80s and 90s where you just expected a referee to be there. And it was always nice to have somebody on the green following the final round. And I think a lot of comps still do that. Um, I think it's a nice touch. Uh, but again, you're not there to enforce the rules. You're there just to tell the players who's in and tell the crowd who's on and keep score and that sort of thing not enforce rules so I think what I'm saying is there's sort of a hybrid set of competitions and I think it would be great if we could actually come up with a set specifically for competition balls that would make the game quicker would make it more exciting would differentiate itself away from I'm going to call it amateur even though it isn't that's not what I mean but the amateur league sides of the game and, and the county games yeah they've all got to be played to British Crown Room totally understand yeah fine but competitions I think you want a set of rules that allows the player to demonstrate their personality so Callum is allowed to be Callum without having to worry about somebody mourning. So Greg, Greg can run his balls up and, and Willie can be Willie and Gary can be Gary and Simon can be Simon and who knows, there might be another Vernon Lee that wants to pop his head over the parapet. Somebody like Colin Scorer who's always entertaining to watch, whether you like him or not, whether you love him or whatever, I think he's marvellous to watch. I, I want more people like him on the bowling ground. So, in answer to your question, Kent, they do it because that's probably how the game really should be played. Um, and unless the opponent is objecting, I don't think it should matter one jot. In th I've been going round competition since I was 16, so that's 31 years uh, I've been involved in the competition circuit, as it was then. Um, and I've never seen anyone complain about somebody running a ball up, stamping a ball, um, not standing on the mat. Never seen anyone getting any sort of altercations about things like that. I have seen people have altercations with, with other players, but it's normally about measuring or somebody telling them they're in when they're not and you know stuff like that, which isn't in the rules anyway. There's no rules to say you shouldn't tell your opponent who's in or you shouldn't lie to them. Or, I mean, I've, I've seen guys, and it, you've probably all heard it, where they've, it's 20 apiece and they've run a ball in, with, you know, the third ball in, and they've run a ball in and they've put this agonised face on and slapped their thigh and thrown their rag in. So their opponent thinks they're in and they've picked the mat up, signal one, and they're not in. The bloke who's just thrown his rag away signals one and gives gives the other bloke a little cheeky smile. What do you do about that? What rules have been infringed there? Anyway, that's probably another Black Arts video for you. But, there you go, 13 minutes of rambling. I don't know if you've took away from it uh, <laughs> what I wanted to get across. But, um, to me, there should be different, there should be different rules anyway. And I, I like the old Blackpool rules, you know, they're virtually professional. Two throws, uh, running after your balls, you can send your balls, you can jack wherever you want. Um, it just gave you that leeway to be yourself and be the player you want to be. And I think the British Crangry rules are quite restrictive, really, you know. If, if your opponent can't send the ball until your ball stops, what does it matter whether you're stood in the line or not? Really, what's what you know? I'll, I could just stand on the mat and you won't be able to see the line. So, what difference does it make, for instance? And I could probably go on about that, but I won't because it's getting on. I need to edit this video, 
this weekend I'm actually out and about on Saturday and Sunday around the bowling green. Whether I'll be doing much bowling is another matter, but I'm hoping to get the camera out again at the Crossland Moor member and guest pairs on Saturday. So hopefully you'll see some footage of that on the Monday vlog. So guys, enjoy the weekend. I hope the weather stays fit. And if you get on the green, stay safe. And I'll see you on the other side.